If only I had an even better relationship, I'd be happy. If only I had children, I'd be happy. If only I hadn't had children, I'd be happy. <laughs> if, if only I traveled more, if only I made more money, if only, if only, if only, until we realize there's no such thing as future happiness. We're either happy now or we're not. This is Dan Millman. He's a former trampoline world champion who has spent the past 40 plus years teaching others how to live with a peaceful heart and a warrior spirit. Best known for his absolutely remarkable book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, which was based on his own life's experiences. And in 2006, it was actually turned into a Hollywood film starring Nick Nolte. His latest work is a memoir that shares stories of his life's course corrections and wake up calls. And he introduces us as a reader to four key mentors who helped shape his life and his teachings. One of the core principles that I teach, Mark, is that there's no best book, no best teacher, no best philosophy, no best religion, no best path or diet or exercise system or martial art. There's only the best for each of us at a given time of our life. I view life as an experiment. We have to find out what works for us. In your own words, what is, uh, I guess, the way of the peaceful warrior? What is it you teach? What is it you train? Well, first of all, somebody came up to me once after hearing me speak and said, Dan, I feel, I don't know, I feel kind of inspired. I said, don't worry, it'll pass. <laughs> because, because inspiration comes and goes and motivation waxes and wanes. We can't necessarily rely on them. They're both fickle. When I was teaching at Oberlin College, I was a college professor at that time, and I was teaching a course in martial arts, specifically around Aikido and Tai Chi. And these are, I was gonna call it naturally for the catalog, way of the warrior, but that didn't quite seem to fit. And this was back in 1973 or so. And because they're internal arts, both of them are more receptive. They're not aggressive arts in that sense. Um, so I ended, a light bulb went on and I said, why don't I call it the way of the peaceful warrior? And at that time I was watching the old Kung Fu TV series, Kwai Chang Kane, you know, the, the quiet warrior priest type. So I was inspired by that as well myself for a while. And years later, when I wrote the book, that term just felt right. I didn't know what to call the book. It was about life in general, but look, I view everyone as a peaceful warrior in training in the school of daily life. Uh, and I, what I mean by that, it's not some arbitrary label. All of us, whatever our role in life, whatever our age, we're seeking to live with a more peaceful heart, a sense of serenity, balance, equanimity in the chaos of the daily news and change. And But at the same time, we also recognize that there are times because of that daily news, we need a warrior spirit to kind of stand up inside of ourselves, roll up our sleeves and get with it and, and do the hard things. So that's why I, I coined that term peaceful warrior. It really applies to all of us and each of us. And the, it's an approach to living a set of life skills. After 20 years of training with four mega mentors, most people haven't heard of, but I, I spent an intensive 20 years preparing myself to do what I do and to develop these life skills that apply in everyday life, not in an ashram. Um, they're not mystical, they don't require any belief structures. You just face daily life, applying certain principles and perspectives that I, I like to share. And now for those who know your story, you grew up almost uh, obsessively focused on on trampoline, which I mean, I don't even know what the, what the sport is. Trampolining, is that, is that the verb? <laughs> <laughs> That's as good a verb as any. And if anybody <laughs> looks on YouTube at World Trampoline Championships, it may blow their mind because most of us imagine somebody jumping up and down in a round backyard trampoline or one of the little indoor things. But actually, if you've seen Olympic 10-meter uh, tower diving, imagine 10 of those most difficult moves in a row. That's what they're doing. Multiple twisting triple somersaults. Uh, perfect form and high, maybe 25 to 30 feet high or 10 meters in, in, in Canada. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> For the rest of the world. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, but, but you grew up like obsessing and getting really in like competitive trampolining, as you mentioned, like, like being able to do all this cool stuff that took you around the world that took you to championships that create, uh, you know, you went to university and college and, and had all these scholarships and stuff. And so the reason I wanted to bring this up real quick off the top is, is in my experience, if those who grew up in athletics 
have a certain training, a certain mindset, certain coaching, certain tools. Those who grew up uh, excelled in the military, certain training, certain culture, certain sets of rules. What we're going to get into with the Peaceful Warrior is something totally different. But I imagine that most competitors who can be athletic at a world championship level have a certain amount of competitive aggression, a certain amount of like putting your body on the limit, pushing through pain. Like you, you, you got to be just like a hardcore badass to be able to win at that level. Was that you? Like, and then, and then you were just totally different when you, Peaceful Warrior became a thing? Well, yes and no. Uh, a bit of a paradox, but put simply, uh, it, it goes back to, believe it or not, when my mother uh, uh, played piano for a, a, a girl's dance class, modern dance. When I was 10 years old, she didn't want to pay for a babysitter. So she ended up enrolling me in a class of 10 girls. And you can imagine that at 10 years old. And, and that taught me some body control. And it wasn't competitive, obviously. It was more about controlling the body and so on. Um, and I was small for my age. And I also, she got me in school in kindergarten um, just when I was eligible. So I was always the youngest kid in class. And because of that, uh, and, and the liking, uh, I probably talked too much for my own good, a, a lifelong habit, I, I suppose. Um, and so I attracted the attention of some bullies. And many of us have had that experience when we were young, um, but it eventually led to an interest in martial arts. So really, I began not in gymnastics or trampoline. I began in martial arts. Uh, I, my dad took me when I asked, how can I learn to defend myself? He took me to a, a boxing class and I discovered very quickly, I didn't really like getting hit or hitting other people. Um, so I, even then I was a peaceful warrior. Uh, I ended up going in judo and judo means the gentle way using someone's leverage to throw people and so on. So as a kid, I studied about a year in judo and then karate and Okinawan style karate. Think Mr. Miyagi and the karate kid. Uh, so I did Okinawa te, and then later uh, Aikido. I, I got a showdown, a black belt in, in Aikido. So now if I'm ever attacked on the street, I can whip out my certificate. Uh, the point is, I've had a variety of martial arts. So that was kind of the badass part, um, the, the rigors, the training. And that combined with the dance when I was a kid, uh, I knew how to point my toes. And it helped, you know, if you're going to be a diver or do an aesthetic sport like gymnastics, artistic gymnastics, it's officially called. Um, to me, it was always performance. It was about how can I do my best? See, even when I started coaching at Stanford University in the U.S., I said to my team, don't aim for success. Aim for excellence because we can't really control success. If we could, everyone would succeed. But we can control our efforts. And by making a good effort, we increase the odds. So I said, aim for excellence. That's what I did as a kid. Yes, and who, who knew that jumping up and down on a trampoline of all things would lead to scholarship to college, a gymnastics career, coaching at Stanford, and then going on to a, a professorship at Oberlin. Uh, I couldn't have predicted that. But we all heard the saying that uh, do what you love and get someone to pay you for it. You know, that's <laughs> a pretty, it's pretty idealistic, but that's what I did. I just, to me, it was play just acrobatic play. I was always so interested in self-improvement. As, as a youth, I took memory courses and speed reading and ventriloquism and acrobatics and martial arts. And I was constantly improving myself. But it, I think it happened after college where I realized, and by the way, I, I think self-improvement's great. Um, because if we're each a cell on the body of earth, a cell on this living creature we call earth, then the better we are, the better it is for the whole planet. So I'm all for self-improvement, but still a, a, an element of disillusion hit me. It was like, no matter how much I improve myself, only one person benefits. But if I could somehow help improve the lives of other people, that made my life even more meaningful. That was my calling as a teacher. And I had no idea at that time how I was gonna do that. It only later did it develop into writing uh, 18 yeah. books over the last 40 years and everything else and speaking around the world. That is, that is, you touched on something that is so cool and something that interests me and inspires me. And I, I, it's, it's like smoke where you just, you, you kind of sense that it's there, but you can't 
grab onto it. And so I'm going to try right now. But when you mentioned like, who would have thought that trampolining would have led to this and this and this, and then that would have led to these things and that would have led to those things and what have you. Yeah. You know, when we look back and we can connect all the dots, I love, I love sitting down with couples and asking them how they met. And I'm almost, I always almost hear, it's kind of a funny story. You know, everybody starts off, it's kind of a funny story. And then they say this, you know, that, that this person was this person's friend and this cousin, and then we were at this. And it's like, and, and you look back and it's like, it's so clear how all the dots connect. And when we look back, we're willing to almost romanticize and say like, life is so crazy and beautiful how it just works out that way. But when we look forward, when we plan the future, we want everything to happen clearly and we're not willing to just let go. And yeah. so, so part of what is smoke to me and hard to articulate is, is this like, I love so much of what you teach and what you stand for and I want to be able to get into it. But a lot of it is rather than looking back on what was and connecting the dots and seeing how it all worked out, it's almost trusting that whatever will happen in the future will be just as cool and romantic and it, like it'll work out. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I do. In fact, a Japanese poet uh, articulated it this way. He said, now that my house is burned down, I own a better view of the rising moon. So the point is, there's a way to approach life uh, that whatever happens, whether it is in line with our desires and wishes um, or not, uh, is part of our destiny. You know, everything seems like destiny looking backwards, as you said. Two cliches I could share. I think one is that uh, we can only understand life looking backwards, but we have to live it forwards, which you referred to a little earlier. Um, and, and the other uh, cliche we've all heard is, is that we are like cars driving through the night and we can only see as far as our headlight beams. But in that way, we can make the whole journey. So I just have had a sense of trust um, to a fault at times. I had no clue in college what I was going to do with my life. And nothing, I wasn't preparing myself for work. I was just preparing, uh, taking courses that interested me that I had to take for my major and so on, not knowing. And I, I didn't know for 10 years after college. Um, sometimes it takes that long to test ourselves, to find out, to gain that self-knowledge, to know what are my, my talents, what are my values, and what are my interests. Knowing those three things really helps guide us. If we don't know ourselves, and it takes a while to do that, uh, then we make the right choice for the wrong person, the one we thought we were. Now, you mentioned relationships earlier. Well, I was married at, at 20 years old. Um, my wife was 19 at the time. She was my first wife. Uh, we were married for eight years, and I don't know how we hung in there that long, but finally we broke apart. And my wife now, love of my life, we've been married 46 years, and I've, I've looked at life from both sides, as they say. So I can speak about relationships from my experience, the difficulties and, and the joys. Um, so anyway, I, I don't want to wander a little bit from the point, but that's, that's how life has unfolded for me. And in a way, it, it unfolds that way for everyone. As you said, synchronicities, funny story, how we end up meeting different teachers, mentors, having different experiences that if we'd made a slightly different choice, wouldn't have happened or maybe a different way. But we do, we do make these choices and, and uh, they lead to whatever, wherever we're going. So talents, values, and interests yes. are the things that we should be focusing on and, and kind of using as a, a compass, I suppose, as opposed to what most of us do, which is what, like, like we're, we're thinking, this is what I should do. This is how life should have worked. This is uh, what yeah. comes next because that's the next thing we do, right? After right. we date, we move in. After we move mm -hmm. in, we get married. After we get married, we have kids. And then suddenly you go, you pull the ripcord and realize, oh, I didn't, I didn't make a single decision exactly. along this whole path of life. And suddenly I find myself in a place I don't want to be. How do we better understand what our talents, our values, and our interests really are? Because mm -hmm. how do we, 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 were, we were marching all along the whole way and it got us here. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe yeah. we're not as good that, as we thought we were at, at really figuring this stuff out. 
Well, I like to define terms because, you know, we've all heard it's good to know thyself. Uh, it's every spiritual, educational, psychological tradition is about self-knowledge, insight work. Uh, again, it helps us make wiser decisions. And many, as you said, Mark, um, instead of saying, what am I interested in? We go, well, what should I do? What what do other people think I should do? Um, and again, if we don't know ourselves uh, well, see, it's easy to say know thyself, but if you know yourself in terms of what you're actually interested in, and it takes time, what your values are, that has to be tested in the world. If you're doing a job that you, you know something about it, you're not really comfortable with it, then you find out that's not really matching my values and my talents. Find out what you're not good at, and then you can find out also what you're good at. Um, it's the kiss a lot of frogs principle in relationships, you know, before you find your prince or princess. So that's so I didn't want to just say know thyself. Everybody says, yeah, that's good. But in those specific areas, and there are many methods of self-knowledge, the MMPI, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, based on Jungian archetypes, basically, there's uh, uh, oh the Enneagram books. Uh, and I was trained by the man who created all the material Dr. that Richard ended up uh, filtering into those books. He yeah. was the first of my four major mentors. I called him the professor. Um, and he was the source of all that material. Um, I have a system. In fact, I invite any of your listeners, if they after they're done listening to us, to go to my website. And I mention it here because it's highly relevant. It's called peacefulwarrior.com. And right on the splash page, they'll see an option for clicking on the life purpose calculator. And if they click on that, it's free. If they click on that, they'll have access to some, just a taste of information uh, about their life path. And there are 45 different life paths for people born uh, since mm, 1750. That's when the Gregorian calendar was invented and it's more accurate. And people are surprised. I mean, it's one of my best-selling books uh, deals with this life purpose system. And it's about specifically answers a question, how do I know myself? So it's one of the most accessible and quick methods to really get a handle on what are my talents? What are my hurdles in life that I was stumbling over in the dark and to shed some light on that? So we stop stumbling so much. So that that is one answer to how we end up knowing our talents, values, interests, our drives, our qualities, our strengths, and our weaknesses. This when you look at these tools, so so Enneagram, for example, like the wisdom of the Enneagram by um, uh, Dr. Richard, uh, Riso. I don't know how to say his name, Riso, Riso? Yeah. Uh, who you said mentored you. You know, I, I picked up that book maybe a decade ago now, and I love the Enneagram. And I have a kind of, it, I've interpreted and lived it so much that that I just understand, it helps me understand myself and others better. But I know at a certain degree, at a certain, to a certain point, that it's not necessarily, I don't know if it stands up to scrutiny or science or any of this other stuff. And, and so as you develop these tools and as you learn these things, do you judge whether it's like right or wrong versus whether it works or yeah. not work? Like is part Good of this question. just releasing like, like there's no right way or wrong way to do it. If it works for you, it works. Well, here, here's the, the thing. And if we were off air, I would say, take a look at the Life Purpose app, really. It's it's all the material in my book, The Life You Were Born to Live. Um, and it's much more accessible. Now, l- let me explain something. When um, there was a man named Oscar Ichazo, he's the man I called the professor. And he created a school. I attended a 40-day, 10 hours a day intensive training, then advanced trainings after that, and then more trainings after that. And he was the modern source of the Enneagram, this this shape, this nine-pointed circle. Some people said it came from Gurdjieff or uh, or the Sufis or the Jesuits. There's a, a slight truth in that, but Gurdjieff only had a shape and some ideas, but Oscar brought this into the world. And later he taught an intensive training almost a year long. One of the people who attended his training nine months long down in Chile uh, was a man named Claudio Naranjo. He was a psychiatrist. And Naranjo started a school in Berkeley, California, and he trained people who trained other people. One of them was uh, Helen Palmer. Another was Stephen Riso. 
and others who ended up writing these Enneagram books. But what the way I was trained was not to take a questionnaire which is you had to do, it was actually uh, by looking at someone's face and even lighting based on the neural connections to the brain, our faces are slightly uneven, most of them. And you can I learn to read the face and tell which of the nine uh, sensitive areas they call personality types. Oh. So the point is there was a lot more to this system than they have in the popular books. And you're that, trained that, in this? Yeah, I was trained in this, yeah. So can you tell my Enneagram number based on my face? A photograph. You know, in even lighting, yes, it's okay. best to do. Um, and it's an art as well as a science, but it's more of an art. So it's it's one of the things I learned from the professor that later got in a way popularized. And, and um, it's one of the messages, the point that to your point, whether or not it's ultimately true with a capital T, I think it's useful. Any platform that allows us to step back and look at ourselves objectively from a distance and see the strengths, the weaknesses, and our qualities. And if it fits, if it really like resonates with you, wow, that's useful. And that self-knowledge humanizes us, humbles us. Um, and, and the life purpose system that I teach, that I developed, and again, with another of my mentors called the Warrior Priest, um, that material uh, has helped well over a million people. It's the book sold well over a million copies yeah. um, because it's extremely accurate. But can I explain how it works? Not actually, but it many people have found it useful as a leverage, as a lens to look at their life and really get a handle on it rather than just wandering around. Yeah. And, and the reason I ask this question is because I've noticed that I bump up against trying to classify things. Uh, another, another book that I would say is probably in, in, the, in, the, in the realm of, of the type of work that you do, you know, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. As I was working through that book, you know, I, I realized that I, I spent a lot of time and energy trying to classify things, trying to figure out what are things called? when really does a name matter? And where does this fit? And where does it come from? And does it work or doesn't it work? And, and as I'm introduced to all of these new concepts that, that frankly are helping me uh, grow stronger, grow more resilient, um, understand, uh, release control, uh, have more faith that things will work out, I still bump up against trying to go like, is this a Buddhist principle? Is this a Zen principle? Is this based off of uh, um, uh, Christianity and I'm, I'm wasting so much time and effort. <laughs> and so the reason I ask is I've just, I, I almost realize at a certain point, I, I just need to get pragmatic about this. Like, like if it works and it helps, who cares really? Like just get on with it, accept it and move on. But I, I find myself bumping up against these classifications that I spend a lot of time on. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in a way the Bruce Lee of spiritual teachings, if it works, do it, find yeah. out what works. Um, and th that's really the key. Uh, by the way, one of the core principles that I teach, Mark, is that there's no best book, no best teacher, no best philosophy, no best religion, no best path or diet or exercise system or martial art. There's only the best for each of us at a given time of our life. I view life as an experiment. We have to find out what works for us. Some people read one book. Some people read another. Like I tried twice to get into Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. And I just couldn't do it. Uh, to me, it was just like too it's up not, in the it's, air. It's not a fun read by any no. means. But. <laughs> but but no, I'm not, that's not, not criticizing the author. It just wasn't for me. It might yeah. be for you or someone else. So uh, we all have to find our own books, our own teachers, our own paths. And it, it has, I come from a place of profound trust and respect for your process and each individual's process. Um, you know, one of the big, but, but how do we know if we're yeah. doing it right though? Like, like it's, uh -huh. it's cool to say my process, but I can, again, kind of a funny story. Mm -hmm. I'm learning about leadership and then I'm introduced to Phil Jackson, you know, the, the, the legendary NBA coach who, who then when I was reading his stuff, he suggested that these are the books he gives to his, you know, rap or his, uh, his, uh, Chicago Bulls players. And one of them was that book. And I thought, huh, why don't I read that book? And it's like, yeah. it's kind of this thing that leads us down the path. And you can say it, you respect my journey. I don't know if I'm doing this right, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, doing it right again, is it right for you? And whatever you choose is right for you. That's, I, I believe wherever we step, the path appears beneath our feet. It may, we can't lose our way. It may feel like it at times, but we're going through a necessary part of our process. Do I know that's true? No, but I choose to look at life that, that way, 
wherever you step, the path appears. And go with it. Go with your interest. Follow your heart. Follow your nose. And if it's a mistake, uh, you learn from it. That's how we learn, by making mistakes. So, But nobody wants to do that. They don't want to make mistakes. When I teach juggling at some of my seminars, those who don't want to let go of that ball another time in juggling, they're the ones that are the slowest learners. And one of the big issues today about doing it right, you know, many young people today are depressed because they're looking at Facebook and and Twitter or Instagram, whatever. And they're going, look at all my friends are having more fun than I am. They're showing their best face. They're laughing. They're happy. They're at these different exotic locations, whatever. And I think it's really a form of suffering because as soon as we compare ourselves to someone else, we're either going to feel inferior or superior. And when I was a a young gymnastics teacher, um, I noticed that some people learn somersaults faster than other people for whatever reason, maybe background in acrobatics. But I also realized that often those who took longer to learn it, learned it better than those who learned it faster. So, you know, somebody once said, I cannot write a book commensurate to Shakespeare, but I can write a book by me. And we have to, you know, live our own life and stop comparing ourselves. And and those of us who get older um, tend to look back, well, when I was young, I used to be able to do this and I used to be able to do that. But again, now we're comparing ourselves to our younger self. What's the point in that? We need to respect our life and enjoy our life. I don't mean it's enjoyable every moment, every day. We go through difficulties. That's part of the peaceful warrior's way, seeing daily life as a form of spiritual weight training. If you don't lift any weights, you don't get any stronger. So we do the hard things. Yeah, well, you've come to the right place for that. Um, help, Help me understand time and place right here, right now. What time is it? It's now. Where are we here? Uh, in your book, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, and, and I'm sure in your other works as well, but, but I, I'm assuming there, um, you talk about the importance of like being present. I live a lot in the past and it makes me depressed. I live a lot in the future and it makes me really anxious. Uh, what I've been saying to myself the last few weeks is just be here now, be here now, be here now, be here now. And uh, it's something that I'm sure I'll get better at. But what are the real benefits to being present? Um, and, and how can we do this better? Most of us understand, or we've heard, the bumper sticker wisdom, live in the present. Uh, but many of us don't fully understand what that means or how to do it, which is why you're asking, I'm sure. And I have a way of expressing that I hope is helpful. First of all, it's paradox again, because the body can only live in the present moment. That's all it has. But our attention, our awareness, our mind flits from what we call the past to what we call the future. We have this human gift and curse that we can project our our awareness into what we call the future, which never comes. It's always the future. But we project, I've got to run these errands today and I'm going to do it in this order. And we also have the great ability to remember, to have these neural impulses in our brain. We call memory, and we call it the past. We go, oh yeah, at my last birthday, this person didn't come. And I remember that because, and we call it the past. But the past is gone forever. All we have is memory and imagination. That's past, that's future. And if someone says, no, no, I know the past exists, Dan, it's real, because here's a photograph uh, of my uh, last uh, dinner I had last Saturday night. And all that's happening in reality is in this present moment, they're showing me an image that is a hook to their memory. But everything is happening right now. If you, if you were sitting on a boat floating down the stream of river of time, and you were sitting there, Mark, and you're, let's say you're meditating or in repose, you're sitting quietly. Now, from someone on the shore watching you, it might seem like you're moving from the past in front of them in the present and then on to the future. But for your reality is you're completely still in the eternal present. And in, a, in effect, a physicist, ask them about the present moment. They'll tell you that it's no such thing. 
Because if I say, if I try to capture the present moment and go now. Yeah, it's gone. It's between in and out, uh, how many, you know, a million nanoseconds have passed. So we can't actually grasp the present nanosecond. We can handle what's in front of us. And the only way to live in the present, to attend to the present, is by seeing the illusory nature of past and future. It's a mental capacity we have, but it's all we have. Our moment of power, our moment of sanity is right now, right here. And people say, well, my mind's so busy. I'd like to quiet the mind. Well, you know what? As soon as we attend to this present moment, the mind's quiet. Because as soon as we think about anything, we're thinking about what we call the past or future. In the present moment, for example, if I, we were sitting across from each other and I took uh, my car keys and I threw them to you and said, catch, and you reached out to catch them in midair, you would not be thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow or what you had for breakfast. You're going to be like a cat, pure focused attention, reaching for those keys to catch them. That's why we like to play Frisbee or, you know, the flying discs, ultimate Frisbee. That's why we like to play musical instruments or perform in a play or do athletics, because that pulls us back into this absorption in the present moment. And that's kind of a blissful thing to do. And the more we realize this is what counts, what's in front of me, and not worry as much about what we're going to do later, or that meeting we're going to where that toxic personality is waiting for us, or what we should have said yesterday. You know, that's the Barbara Rasp, a writer, once said, the lesson is simple. The student is complicated. And we complicate everything, past and future, emotional ups and downs. Uh, we complicate sex. We complicate diet, everything. Instead of just living Zen-like in this moment, doing what we need to do. And, and I want you to tell me it is, but is it enough? Like, is yesterday, we, Sunday afternoon, beautiful day. Uh, we have my, my mom over. We have my uh, siblings over and their kids. So my nieces and nephews are over. And my kids are all playing. And there, there were points where I was just like, honestly, kind of bored of the conversation. But I was, I would, I, rather than think of, well, I have to do this later. And what about this? And what's happening this week? And what can I do with this project? And, and like going off into my zone, I, I just, you know, be here. Be here right now. And, and it was the perfect type of moment because there were so many other things I could have been doing. <laughs> but, but I thought, you're like, okay, if, if my mom is, is speaking about this story and sharing this story, if I'm present, then that's a gift I'm giving her because I'm, I'm acknowledging her, I'm seeing her, I'm listening to her, I'm contributing to her. So I was able to like play a little game of like, well, what's wrong with being a little bit bored? And what's wrong with taking this moment? But I'm trying to struggle with being present is the answer because that is what matters most. And that is what helps you form deeper connections. And that's what helps you enjoy the moment. And I go out for a walk every morning. And I watch the sun come up and I look at the sky and I drink my coffee and I just spend 30 minutes just very walking very slowly, just trying to like wake up. And I go like, wow, what a beautiful day. But then it's gone. It's like, it just doesn't feel like for, for those of us who are high achievers and, and building stuff and want to build lasting legacies, like the moment comes and the moment goes and that's all, that's all it is. Well, I, I'd like to share a brief story. Um, the story I tell is um, Socrates and I are in the gymnasium, just the two of us. And he's watching me as I recover from a broken leg, a shattered femur. Um, and Socrates really, was one of your mentors. Well, um, the truth about all that is revealed in my new uh, memoir, your new Peaceful book, Heart, but, Warrior Spirit. Yeah. But for those who know um, the story, Socrates was uh, a mentor. Yes, in, in Way of the Peaceful Warrior, he's, my, he's an old gas station mechanic who becomes my teacher, like Mr. Miyagi, like, like Merlin to Arthur, like uh, Gandalf to Frodo, and so on. Um, one of those classic student-teacher relationships. And so we're in the gym, and he's watching me, and I'm doing a dismount off the high bar because my leg is strong enough now to, to practice again, and I'm doing a full-twisting double somersault, some such thing, and I stick my landing. Most people know that's a good thing. So I land, I go, yes. And I figured that was a good place to stop workout for the evening on a high point. So I rip off my sweatshirt, throw it in my bag, and we're walking down the hallway afterward. And Socrates turns to me and says, you know, Dan, that last movie you did was really sloppy. And I said, what? 
I don't understand. I said, that was the best dismount I did in a long time. He said, oh, I'm not talking about your dismount. I'm talking about the way you took off your sweatshirt and put it in your bag. And he, he pointed out that I was treating one moment as special, doing going off the high bar, and another moment as ordinary, folding, throwing my shirt in my back. And he reminded me once again that there are no ordinary moments. We just make them that way. That's the way we view them. That could have been a blissful moment. You with family and the kids running around, getting into their heads and their hearts, you know, and with the excitement they're doing, trying to discover the world and, and figure out relations and playing and the rules and all that. Um, but often we're just, and, and you pointed it out a few minutes ago. One of the greatest gifts we can give anyone is our real attention. You know, children yearn for it and they'll misbehave just to get our attention. Um, so just by actually being with someone, even for a few seconds or a minute or two, but really being there with them rather than thinking what you else we could be doing. And by the way, I'm not preaching from on high here. Uh, you know, I have three grandchildren. We're learning about, again, discovering, rediscovering. Um, they're they're uh, three, six, and nine years old. Um, and of course, I raised three daughters too. And I made all my mistakes. You know, children have never been very good at listening to what their parents have to tell them, but they never fail to imitate them. So the best <laughs> we can do for our kids is be a good example. Not perfect. We learn two steps forward, one step back. So I always recommend to people, be gentle with yourself. We learn, we make mistakes, we get better over time. And, and so, um, but that, that's, that's how I would address that, that issue. By the way, I got this line into the, the scene, into the movie. Uh, Socrates says, Dan, the difference between us is you practice gymnastics. I practice everything. And it was like, what? What do you mean practice everything? But you know, it, it started to make real sense to me because most of us do things every day. We do our work, we do our homework, we do our job, we do the house cleaning, whatever it is we do. But as soon as we view it as practice, what, do we, what does it mean to practice? It means you're doing something with the object to refine it or improve it. And it pulls in a better quality of attention. So somebody can just be walking down the street and then they go in and pick up their violin and start playing. Now they're practicing. But what if they were practicing walking down the street? Yeah. What if they were practicing opening the door? What if they were practicing breathing? Through the nose, in and out, smooth action while they move. That is like doing Tai Chi. It brings us back. We practice. When we sign our names, how many of us are signing our names trying to do it a little better than last time? <laughs> By practicing everything, it makes us absorbed in this moment. You're and making me so uncomfortable right now. <laughs> I, I totally understand because you're seeing it as a form of achievement. Oh my God, now Dan's telling me I have to practice every moment. How exhausting. Well, so 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 this is the thing. Like the, the yeah. idea of the way you do any the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Is that is yes. that the line? Yes. I am so struggling with that because to your point. There's lots of stuff that I do really shitty and quick and knock it out. And there's other things that I take incredible amounts of time and effort and energy in. And because I have these like high bar achievements and these like, uh, I'm super lazy, just do it. Like the thought that when I hear the way you do uh, anything is the way you do everything. I think suddenly now everything needs to hit this high bar achievement, the very best. And I just don't have... I just don't feel like I have the energy for that, but I, I know totally that I'm, agree. I know that I'm looking at this wrong. Right? Yeah, I totally agree. When, when my wife and I kick back in the evenings and watch a stream, a, a movie or a, a, some TV series we like, we're just kicking back. I'm not trying to be the best TV watcher. It's not <laughs> a matter of achievement. I'm just kicking back and being in the moment and enjoying the show. And most of us, when we're watching a video game, doing a video game or watching TV or some video, we are in the moment. It pulls us into the moment because we're occupied. The problem is many of us are getting short attention spans. You know, unless it's the, our reticular activating system in the brain stem is always looking for new stimulating uh, things. So we want more uh, stronger tasting foods, more spicy foods, stronger movies, more shocking, more. And, and we need to retune our reticular activating system. So we begin to notice the small things. Because sometimes the small things are really big things. 
uh, but we're missing it. And so the Japanese call it forest bathing, just walking through a wooded area. You probably do that sometimes. And most of us enjoy that, walking through a wooded area and actually looking up in the trees, notice the birds, notice how they're, they look different, not just birds, but maybe wrens or finches or cardinals and see if you can you know, just kind of look at them and see how they behave. Listen for the sounds around you. Um, it's not a stressful achievement oriented thing. Because one of the lessons I learned at the end of Way of the Peaceful Warrior was achievement is empty. People can achieve. You know, Joseph Campbell said, sometimes we climb to the top of our professional ladder only to realize it's leaning against the wrong wall. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? So we realize, gee, do I really want to be an attorney or do I want to be this? Or, and then we reexamine our values. And it's again, we live and learn and, and to relax into all that. It's not some assignment I'm giving you or anybody else. It's just, it's more, it's more of a blissful life, just, uh, and less worries, less stress by just focusing what's real, what's real right now, right now, us talking. Yeah. That's all that's real. Yeah. In January, I, um, so my backstory, I started a creative agency 15 years ago as an uh -huh. entrepreneur built it before COVID, multi-million dollar, 24 team, person team, was really not digging it. <laughs> like, was trapped by my own, hey, this ladder is leaning against the wrong wall, it turns out. Um, and I had to spend a few years unwinding a bunch of stuff to clear space for what's next. Mm -hmm. And in January, February, March, I realized that somewhere along the way, I actually gave up on ambition. I was a very ambitious teenager and a very ambitious person in my 20s. And at a certain point, either stories or family or whatever it was I was telling myself, I gave up and stopped pushing and stopped being ambitious because I thought maybe it was um, selfish or um, greedy or whatever it was. But, but I realized that my ambition is actually one of my greatest assets. And so coming out of a year or two of being much more trusting that the future will work out, not gripping things quite so tightly and trying to control everything and just being, frankly, um, much more zen, I guess it would be. I don't know what the term would be. I'm going to call it zen. I have that version of me now where I can move comfortably and slowly, but I don't feel like I necessarily am working as I'm pushing things as hard as I would when I'm feeling very kind of zen and trusting. And on my other side, I have this ambition that requires just a lot of energy and focus and drive and push. And so in January, I said, hmm, I wonder if this year I can figure out how to hold both things at the same time, how I can still accomplish and still um, uh, uh, be ambitious and still support my family and build a great company and do all of these things and, and work towards a goal I have. And yet still somehow on the other side, hold these other things that will make it not quite such a pressure cooker all yeah. the time. Are these things possible? Can I do both things at once? And if so, how? Wow. Help, help I, I love the questions. Love the questions. Um, well, there, there are two kind of, kind of uh, comments I'd have. Uh, first, many of us are caught up in the uh, Western promise of happiness. Unleash your power, achieve, succeed, find financial abundance um, and respect and all that stuff of the yeah, West. Yeah, I, I want all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. It's the extroverted, you know, Tony Robbins uh, typifies that, you know, the extroverted, success-oriented person. Those who achieve that or who burn out trying to achieve it um, sometimes turn to the Eastern solution to happiness which is just as one-sided, but it's different. The Eastern solution is let go of the things of the ego. Uh, outward ambition is empty. Turn inward. All your answers lie within. It's all about the realm of inner work, the spiritual quest, and so on. Um, and, and sorry but, to interrupt, but th that also sounds good to me too. So, yes. so, well, so I'm good uh, with Tony. I'm good with Eastern. Just tell me which one's the right one. <laughs> Well, and that's the point. It's not either or, it's and both, you know, both uh, and. Because I've been to the East, 
And I've met some grumpy monks, let me tell you. <laughs> so the, the point is, um, neither exclusive orientation. We we have two sides of the brain. We have two sides of the body. We're meant to balance both of those. It's embracing the best of East and West, enjoying the things of the world, enjoying achievement and success and all that. I mean, I've made some decent money, you know, and I've supported my family and kids and and uh, we had a five bedroom house in Marin County, California. Yeah, but, but, my but wife... you've also been a published author who's written tons of stuff and had a movie made out of your stuff. So, I mean, we and, and was a world champion at things like we can knock out some. Right. Some, so some I, I did my resume. achievements. Yes. Yeah. And, and I I'm ambitious. Uh, I try to do whatever I do, including spiritual questing <laughs> the best I can. Uh, and, and that's why I say, you know, in the Buddha, apparently the, the story is when the Buddha was about to, to pass into the other world, transition, whatever, die, basically, um, people said, do you have any last words? And he said, yes, just do your best. And, and whatever that may be day to day, uh, in a sense, by definition, we always do our best. Some days are better than others, but we're doing the best within our own scope and our own uh, sight. Do you think people are really actually doing their best, though? Because that's... They're not Again. doing their ultimate 100% idealistic um, perfection. But yes, for example, I believe that our parents did the best they could in raising us, whether they were aware, kind, compassionate, understanding, or whether they were cruel and abusive. They were still doing the best they knew how with the wounds they were working with, the blind spots, this, their own suffering. They were doing the best they could. It may not have been very good. Some days better than others. So in that same sense, each of us does what we can each day. But the idea that we're not, we could be doing better is crazy making. I have young men sometimes come up to me, especially young men, some women. Dan, I'm, I'm really doing pretty well, but I don't think I'm reaching my full potential. How many times have we heard that? And I go, well, maybe you did. Maybe yesterday was your high point of potential. And now you can just coast. I mean, who knows? Who knows? But I think it's crazy making whatever I'm doing, I could be doing better. What kind of thought is that to live with every day? Could be well, doing better. I, I, could be doing better. It's a trap How about that, that we doing, live in. You're doing what you're doing, you know? Um, could I, when I look back on this interview, could I have said a few things differently? Probably, but I'm doing fully what I'm doing right now with you, and it's the best I can do. And that's how I live. Yeah. So, so I struggle with the thought that, like, if people, if 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 I'm falling short of a certain way that people can and should live, I almost want to know what that is so I can hit that level. If my expectations, though, are unrealistic, and people tell me that, I'm willing to let it go. And here's a great example. Last year, I went through this health challenge and I got really lean. Um, I got to like a 13% body fat, which I was happy with. But I know that there are other people who can hit 10% or 7% or 6%. Now, when you get below 10%, it's not sustainable. I know that. But everyone in my life was like, you're already so lean at 13%. Why would you want more? And I was like, well, because more could be achieved. But but I'm willing to let go of something that's unsustainable, like a 7% or 6%. If I feel like we, we could make millions and millions of dollars, let's say $10 million next year, um, and we're only making five, well, then I'm falling short. If in my geography, if in my area, we look at all the numbers and we realize, well, 10 is not really achievable, I'm willing to let that go. But I'm always trying to figure out whether I am being slow or lazy or scared or not pushing hard enough and there is the next level to hit or if really there isn't and I should let it go and go focus on something else. And and I guess part of this just like trusting that things will work out, that things will be, that live in the moment, let go of all that stuff. Coming back to the like living Zen versus with ambition, being Tony Robbins versus being East, like in the middle place, it just doesn't seem like there's any rules to this game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think the meeting ground, the bridge for both of us and all of us is a sense of purpose. You know, I used to think that the ultimate goal, the reason we're doing everything, whether it's 10% or 6% body fat, whatever it is, we think we're going to be happier because the end of every rainbow is happiness, uh, a better relationship, Better this, you know, it's funny. Sometimes I, I reminded folks that um, the best thing about going to college or university is we find out it doesn't make us happy. 
<laughs> there are people who don't go to college or don't go to university. And for years, they look back, if only I'd gone to university and graduated, that's I'd be that's, happy. Dude, that's, if, that's so me. <laughs> all right. How about this? If only I had an even better relationship, I'd be happy. If only I had children, I'd be happy. If only I hadn't had children, I'd be happy. <laughs> if, if only I traveled more, if only I made more money, if only, if only, if only, if only when I retire, if I only had more respect, you know, and until we realize there's no such thing as future happiness. We're either happy now or we're not because the future never comes. It's not about future anything. It's right now. And by the way, happiness is not just some giddy feeling that descends upon us. We've all experienced that, but it never lasts. Happiness, I view, in terms of this peaceful warrior's approach to living, I view happiness as a practice. And somebody might say, well, that sounds good, but what do you mean practicing happiness, Dan? Well, I ask people, how do you behave when you're feeling happy? We all know what that, we've all felt happy. Are you more present? Yeah. Are you more enthusiastic when you're feeling happy? Yeah. Uh, are you kinder when you're feeling happy than when you're unhappy? Yes. Good. Do all those things. That's the practice of happiness. You see, one of the most controversial things that I teach, and I'm not just like, uh, how do I put it? In a way, I'm just another teacher. You speak with a lot of authors and teachers and so on. But what makes it a bit different? And if you uh, come to that part in my new memoir on the sage, he brought me back to earth and reminded me of a couple of things which is why I do not encourage people to feel happy or kind or loving or peaceful or confident or courageous. I only encourage people to behave in those ways because I've learned after a lot of study and deep contemplation and observation that we have less control over what emotions are passing through us in any given moment uh, than we have over what we actually do. We have less control over what thoughts appear in our mind or appear in our awareness, just pop up. Sometimes positive, sometimes negative thoughts. But we have less control over that than we, what we actually do, how we behave, moving our arms and legs and our mouth. So my focus in this approach to living is doing what we need to do. You know, a man named Shoma Morita, a psychiatrist, a Japanese psychiatrist, once put it this way. He said, when running up a hill, it's okay to give up, to quit as many times as you want, as long as your feet keep moving. Ah. My coach always says, show me something rather than nothing. And, and it's like, I want to be, be an all or nothing guy, but yeah. I know that the real answer is, like you said, keep moving. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I created about 40 years ago, I created a workout I've done every single day. Well, no, I actually had a really bad flu about 20 years ago, and I just visualized doing it. But except for those few days, every day, no matter where I was in the world, I did this workout. It's a four minute workout, the Peaceful Warrior Workout. It's deep flowing movement, uh, tension release, uses every part of the body coordinated with the breathing. And it's only four minutes a day. It's based on the principle, a little of something is better than a lot of nothing. We, so it's simple as powerful because we're more likely to do it rather than the all or nothing thing. You can always find three and a half minutes to do some exercise. Now I do more than that, but as a minimum, it's really a good way to wake up, start the day right. And so that's why I recommend to people dream big, but start small and then connect the dots. And, and just in wrapping up the conversation, I always like to, to conclude with this. For you, at the end of the day, what does everything come down to? Well, it's, uh, one of my books is called The Laws of Spirit. It's about spiritual and universal laws. My work is based on those laws, not just my opinion or any kind of beliefs. Like the law of gravity, it works whether we believe it or not. So I would say uh, one of the primary spiritual laws is the law of surrender or the law of acceptance. And surrender sounds passive, uh, like capitulating to someone else's ego or something. But really, it's the most intelligent, creative response we can make to any moment, because life unfolds as it will, whether or not we happen to like it. Life unfolds a certain way. Stress happens when the mind resists what is. 
So the more we're able to embrace what is and appears, you know, life comes at us in waves of change that we can't predict or control, but we can learn to surf. And that's what I mean by acceptance, just kind of going with what happens and making use of it. And like a good martial artist, you know, use the force and turn it around and make it work for you. That is so beautiful. One of the biggest takeaways, and I, and I hope that, I mean, the takeaway I had from, from your work was that change will happen. Uh, whether <laughs> I dictate it or not, I will change. That I'm capable of change and I'm capable of dictating and directing that change. And once you accept, once I accept that one, I will and can change, I can direct that change rather than just leave it to chance. The, the, the scary part for me is then asking like, will I step up and do it? And no one else is going to do it for me. No one else is going to come along and do the hard work or make the hard conversation or do the hard conversations or make the hard decisions or try and fail and, and risk looking like a fool in front of everyone else. But, but there's not really any alternative because I can and will change and either I direct that, see what happens, or I just leave it up to chance, which sounds terrible to me, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, we've heard the saying that life will lift us up or grind us down depending on a response to the moment. And so it's not like we have to change or somehow be different from the way we are. There are fundamental ways we're still us. Um, but it's just adapting to the moment. Um, you know, in martial arts, uh, life comes at us in different ways and, and, and you, we just adapt. You know, one of the principles that I teach is that I view earth as a divine school for souls. That's how I view the earth. And that means daily life is our classroom. What, what does that mean? A well, divine school for the yeah, uh, it, I hate to bring up, name drop all of my books, but it, it's relevant. There's a book I wrote called The Four Purposes of Life. And one of the purposes... Um, is learning life's lessons. And you might say, well, fine, but what lessons does life offer? Well, I wrote another book that involves 12, <laughs> no, really, the 12 courses in the school of life. And um, I can, let me summarize it as this, that lessons repeat themselves until we learn them. Have you noticed that? Yeah. No, no. I know that. Ray Dalio calls it another one of those. And uh, another I've seen one of those. too many another one of those. And, and I often get stuck in the trap between trying to figure out whether I have the ability to change mm. those things or whether they're, they're core. And it's just like, out, yeah, another one of those. Yeah. But if we don't learn the easy lessons, they get more dramatic. Yeah. And there's, there's a great story about a man uh, uh, named Ralph who was given a parrot. The parrot's name was Maurice. And it was a beautiful bird. He had a lot of words he could say, but someone had taught him to curse like a sailor. And, and it embarrassed Ralph because Maurice would, you know, his mother would come over and Maurice would start cursing a very colorful language that he learned. And Ralph tried everything to reform this bird. He played new age music. He played Anya, you know, or Enya. He, he taught him affirmations and took him to a bird therapist, but nothing worked. And so finally, Ralph reached the end of his patience and, he, and the bird was cursing one day and he grabbed Maurice and he shoved him in the freezer and shut the door, the icebox. And he heard muffled squawking and cursing in there and suddenly dead silence. And, you know, he, he said, oh, I hope I haven't hurt the bird. And he quickly opened the freezer and reached in. And, and Maurice walked out on his arm, stood on his shoulder and said in Ralph's ear, Ralph, I realized that my behavior could use some improvement. And I, and I know my language needs reforming. I had a revelation in that freezer. And I want you to ask, I want to ask your forgiveness. And yeah, Ralph was pretty pleased. And then Marie said, oh, by the way, uh, Ralph, I noticed in the freezer there, there, there was a chicken wrapped up with his head cut off. Can you tell me what the chicken did wrong? <laughs> and the point is, Maurice wanted to learn the easy lesson. He didn't want to learn the harder one. And that's a moral for all of us. Um, just to pay attention, notice what's going on around us and adapt to it like a good martial artist. We don't have to change who we are, our being or anything like that, or core personality, but we can adapt our behaviors. That's doable. Trying to develop, trying to fix our insides and have just the right positive thoughts or just the right emotions to live wisely and well is gonna be a little crazy making because we don't have a lot of control over the emotional weather that passes through us or the thoughts that are changing. 
But if we focus on what do I need to do right now? What is my purpose in this moment? And go and do it. And that's, that's doable. And uh, it's a, a good approach to living, I think.